In the last couple of days, we've had two great things happen. Lola Edwards turned 99 on Thursday. We celebrate for her. I know she is with us, uh, tuning us in today. And Lola, happy birthday, happy 99. And I got a text from the Bendick family, from Camille, that Luke won the Big Ten pole vaulting championship this weekend. So that's fantastic. Congratulations to both. On the other hand, and as we come to this time, I would ask for prayers and a moment of silence as we step into this time uh, for the people of Ukraine and for those in Russia who are fighting back against the oppression of their own leadership. For both people on both sides of the border, but particularly the Ukrainians under assault, let us help hold a moment of silence. Today we have a story that opens on a high and holy mountain and ends in a valley of human need. Luke takes us from transfiguration mountain to healing valley, from pure light to healing light. So I invite you to join on this, on this journey of faith. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. To the Native American Lakota Sioux Nation, society is experienced as a spiral. At the outer edge of the spiral are those too young to know many stories, too recently born to have experienced much of life. This outside of the spiral is alive, but it is not yet quite real. The little ones on the outside carry promise. They carry the potential of reality, but they have not yet wound their way into the story itself. A few spirals further in are their parents. They are older. They know more stories. They are more real, more substantial, and their potential, their promise, has begun to take shape. Deeper yet into the spiral are the elders, the grandparents, and the great-grandparents, who have gone round the circle of years many more times and know more stories and older ones. They are real and substantial in a way that the young ones must learn to understand. When they speak, the young ones are to listen and to learn. But what really matters in this spiral of the Sioux Nation is that it doesn't stop with the oldest living elders in the inner circles. The spiral into society and reality goes on deeper into the stories older than any person alive and present in the family. It goes deeper and deeper into the stories that are older than that, deeper as it turns the stories up and around the ancient stories of all time. The oldest stories possess the deepest degree of reality. The most solid substance goes back before time, even the oldest elders, generation by generation, to the time when stories first we're told. Because this is Native American spirituality, intermingled with the spirals of human society across time are the figures that also spiral. Snakes and lizards, rivers and rocks, sand and raging tornadoes and hurricanes. You've all seen them on weather reports from way up in space a spiral. All of creation wraps itself in these powerful spirals of life and unleashes itself in the seasons of the earth. And let us be clear about spirals. 
While our native sisters and brothers wind the spiral into their understanding of family, society, creation, and all of life, they're not the only ones. According to the writings of anthropologist Jose Luis Cardero, the Celts and many ancient peoples used spirals to represent the concepts of the great cosmic river of the universe. Then the spiral is the basic configuration of chakras in the body that symbolize a change in scale or even a portal into another dimension. In other words, the spiral is a symbol of the spiritual path to be traveled in life. Not unlike the labyrinth that First Congregational Church now has in Paris Hall. This symbol is one which represents time. Going back to the Paleolithic caves, it's constantly repeated throughout the history of life on this planet. As I read the story of transfiguration in Luke's Gospel, I think of the innermost spirals of time and reality, which the ancient Lakota Sioux believe is where real things happen. We are really near the outer edge of the spiral. Peter, James, and John are more real, and they move closer into the narrative of pure light. And even more real than that is Jesus, who is still a young man when this story unfolds. But there he meets two that are more real than he is. Elijah and Moses. When they show up, they are characters from the oldest stories of the Jews. As we know, each ascended into the essence of God's being, lifted up and carried away. The oldest characters that we can imagine, we meet in the New Testament, but they've just been outdone by figures that are not only millennium earlier, but figures that are the stories older than the oldest stories. They are very close to the center of the spiral, to the creation of God's plan in the universe. In this spiral view of reality, the oldest stories, the oldest figures, are the most real of all. Imagine that. Imagine that today we are not witnessing a hologram or the, the ghosts of Hamlet's father, present but insubstantial. Rather, on the high and holy mountain, in the fullness of time, the full representation of all the prophets and the law are revealed as real and absolutely connected to each one of us, even those who are young and small on the outer rim of this spiral. Their stories connect to each one of us as real, not imagined, not mythical, real. And why not? Why can't we imagine this? It's a simple lack of imagination and a dearth of deep spiritual connectedness that keeps us apart from Peter and James and John and Jesus and Moses and Elijah. If we fail to see these connections in the spiral of life and time, maybe what is really missing is our ability to imagine our timeless connections to mystery and power in the creative design of God's immense universe. This is a real story, as real as real could be, if you use this entrance into this time. A mistake often made by preachers on this text is our failure to recognize the full extraordinariness and the realness of this transfiguring event. Instead, we as proclaimers of God's words throughout time have tried to fit this story into the contours of our limited experience. We who are still on the outside of the spiral coming in. Let's face it, this story of transfiguration is among the most utterly unique passages in Holy Scripture. Like Peter, James, and John before us, we want to build shrines. We want to compare our own mountaintop experiences to this one. To do this is to treat it as commonplace when it's not. This is truly transformational. It is to treat it as if you will, an outer spiral story replaces a core story. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are changed into pure light. I don't know if that's happened to you on your mountaintop experiences, but it never happened to me. 
They are changed into pure light. And in the midst of that, God cries from the mountaintop, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. God hasn't spoken like that since the baptism, which was just a few weeks ago in our readings. This is so stunning and so surreal. Even the disciples are speechless now. Once God's voice has clarified this powerful truth, Moses and Elijah move on. That's what they do. They have come to the center, delivered their presence, and they go. As beautiful as our mountaintop experiences may have been, this one is unparalleled. It is the mountaintop experience. As the spiral turns tighter and tighter, and the ancestors and true lights of our faith shine brighter and brighter, the spiral then unwinds just a bit as the story comes to an end, as it moves to a new place. Jesus and the three disciples all walk down from the mountain, the mountain of transfiguration, and they come back and enter the valley of discipleship. Once in the valley, those in need of healing and cleansing come running up to Jesus. And in that sort of weird passage that we just heard, they are mad. Jesus gets mad because the disciples, who he's given all the gifts for healing to, didn't heal this child, right? So he sort of yells at them first and then says, bring the boy to me. <laughs> so Jesus immediately gets back to work. He doesn't get a day off. He doesn't have a Sabbath rest. He returns to his ministry where he administers healing light. It reminds me of a story I once heard from Bon Jovi. He had returned from a concert tour in which he'd sold out the largest auditoriums and stadiums in the world. And he came in the house and found a note on the kitchen counter that read, hey BJ, please take out the garbage and recycling and see you in the morning when you can start fixing up all the chores that you haven't done. Yikes, so much for a high moment. <laughs> like that, life is, comes to us just like that. No matter what our peak experiences have been, we eventually come down to earth to take out the garbage and work on our to-do list. So here we are. Having left the mountain of transfiguration, we come down the mountain, and along with the disciples and Jesus, we find ourselves in a deep valley. In our time, and this week, it's a valley where evil has been unleashed. For the first time in 83 years, a full-out war is raging with the unmitigated attack of Russia against their non-aggressive neighbors, Ukraine. It would be like the United States of America attacking Canada. Taking a page from Adolf Hitler's world domination playbook, Vladimir Putin attacked Ukraine full force early Thursday morning, lying and claiming a threat which was no threat at all, Putin simultaneously attacked no less than 12 Ukrainian cities by air, sea, and land. Not since the Nazis under Adolf Hitler rolled into Poland in September 1939 has Europe seen such an unjust onslaught. This morning, as we worship, Ukrainian soldiers and armed volunteers, citizens from the streets, are literally fighting for their lives, fighting for their families, and fighting for the sovereignty and freedom of their democratically elected nation as they defend the nation in the capital city of Kyiv. Meanwhile, across the border, there are bold Russians fighting back against Putin too, and they need to be remembered on this day. As we stand on the outside looking in, we see the spiraling story which winds its way through Ukrainian history, a history rife with horrible anti-Semitism and hate, the worst attack on Jews since the Bible happened in Ukraine from 1648 to 1658, during which time as many as 100,000 Jews were killed and 300 villages were destroyed. During the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s, it is believed that 1.5 million Jews in Ukraine were killed, including 34,000 who were executed by the Nazis at Beryar, a ravine outside of Kyiv. 
on September 29th and 30th, 1941. It was the single largest mass killing during the Holocaust. No monument stands there, only a stiff cliff, a steep cliff now marks this place of horror. As this story spirals in, Ukraine is led by President Zelensky. He is a Jewish comedian. And outside of Israel, I might say the Prime Minister of Israel is not a comedian. Ukraine is the only nation in the world led by a Jewish president. As we go deeper into the spiral of this living story, let us remember that the Ukrainians themselves have had their own national tragedies. The modern story of Ukraine bears witness to the twin bestialities of both Nazism and the Soviets. Stalin's five-year plan decimated the Ukraine. He literally starved them to death by the millions. In 1933, it is the greatest humanly caused famine in history. During the years that both Stalin and Hitler were in power, more people were killed in Ukraine than anywhere else in Europe or in the world. Stalin, like Putin now, did not see the Ukrainians as human. He saw them as property of Russia. As Timothy Snyder writes in Black Earth, the Holocaust as history and warning, Hitler thought the Slavs were subhuman. He wanted Ukraine's fertile lands. So between 1933 and 1945, the Nazis and the Soviet regimes deliberately murdered around 14 million civilians in the Bloody Lands, the region that now extends from central Poland to western Russia through Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states. The Ukrainian spiraling story is deep, and it is packed with stories of death and survival of heroes and villains. Today we stand at the outer edge of this spiral and learn from the center that the spirits and the stories of this people are real and they are powerful and they will not go unheard or unheeded. They will not yield, they will not surrender. They are warriors who will stand and fight and we cannot forsake them or forget them. We have to stand with them. I close this today with a story as retold in the Hasidic tales of the Holocaust. It is a story about something that happened in Janowska, which was a work camp just outside the capital city in Lviv, Ukraine, during the Second World War. The Nazis forced the Jews in the camp to dig a huge pit. And then they forced them to leap across. Those who successfully made the jump would live, and those who fell into the pit met their death. Two men stood at the edge of the pit, Rabbi Israel Spira and his friend, who was a free thinker and an anti-religious Jew. Even though neither man was in great physical shape, they both jumped, and they both made it across the pit. The freethinker asked the rabbi as he turned to him, how did you do it? And the rabbi replied, I was holding on to my ancestral merit. I was holding on to the coattails of my father and my grandfather and my great grandfather of blessed memory. And the rabbi turned to his friend and said, but you, my friend, how did you reach the other side? The rabbi's friend answered, I, was holding on to you. May this tale hold so close to the center of the spiral of life from a work camp in the Ukraine during the Second World War give us all courage to leap across the pits of despair that we face and that others are up against and to find people to hold on to as we leap. And may we walk through the valley, hanging on to and holding up our Ukrainian sisters and brothers in the days that are before us. Amen.